Hi. Hi. Hi, Demi. Hi, Carol. Hi, Hi Julie. Demi. Hi. Hi, David. Hey. Um, Daz, I hope it's okay. I also put in the chat window my nonprofit. You had put my um, URL for my for profit, but my nonprofit is probably more interesting to people. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes it's, in fact, often it's more interesting to me. So the more the better. Yep. Oh, I see Anita is here and Grin. Cool. Yeah. Lots of, lots of usuals. Yeah. Right here. We'll, give, we'll give it a couple more minutes, uh, just just for a few few strikers, and then we'll, you know, we'll we'll let you start, and I'll let the people in as as they arrive. Wait, that was a mixed message, so I should start or I should wait. Uh, just give it. Say, let's give it. It's it's four minutes past. Let's give it. Say two more minutes, just in case. Okay. Uh, I do, as I said to you, though, I do expect some people to uh, come later because you know they might not have got the uh, GMT BST time zone. Sure. And by the way, anyone here? So I'm walking on a treadmill because I find it much easier to think and talk when I'm moving. I've always been like that. But if you find that it's making you seasick, <laughs> let me know and I'll slow down the pace. I do need to move just a little bit so that I can function. Um, but let me know and I'll make it even slower <laughs> if it's a problem. It's Maybe we should make it a standard thing so we all do it. Get so, get our ten thousand <laughs> steps in. I'm telling you, I get in many more steps these days with my little treadmill. It's got it wasn't too expensive, and it and it has no front bar, so you can stick it under your desk. Yeah. And so, and then I have a little remote, and I can change the speed without having to lean down. And then I've got my standing desk, so I can do a lot of work, and uh, yeah. I get many miles and many meetings. Excellent. <laughs> Much needed as we're all spending more time in front of these uh, these screens nowadays. Yeah. Fitting. <laughs> I'm the same with moving moving around. It just helps me think, but it drives my wife absolutely insane. She's like, "Can you can you sit down? Stop it! I can't listen to you." I just go, "No." <laughs> <laughs> if you if you want me to make sense, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you'll just have to shut your eyes. Hello to whoever said hello to me a while ago. I'm sorry. Hey, Ida. Um, was it Ju Julie? I might have. Oh. Or maybe Julie oh. did. I don't know. Julia, yeah. Okay. Julie, is your last name Tasker or are you a Tasker? <laughs> My last name is Tasker, but I'm also a Tasker. Got it. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I can't believe I've got into remote viewing since. <laughs> yeah, that is destined from birth. Yes. I'm definitely a multitasker. Cool. It's funny how sometimes people's names are so right for them, you know. Okay, Julia, well, I think we've let uh, all the stragglers in right now. I'll keep an eye on it as we're going and I'll let, I'll let anyone else who comes along in. Um, so yeah, feel free to, to start. We're all looking forward to this. Okay, great. So just a little background on me. Um, I was raised up in the world of academia, largely in neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience, computational neuroscience and systems neuroscience. So a bunch of different kinds of neuroscience. And um, what I noticed is that in the race to try to figure out what's going on with the brain, there was a lack of development of our understanding of what's going on with the mind. And that became much more interesting to me um, because you're always gonna find something in the brain that corresponds to whatever the mind is doing. But in the end, showing a little spot on a little graph of the brain and saying, this is what lights up when you do this ends up not actually explaining a lot of things. Um, so I fell out of love with that line of questioning and went into trying to understand the human relationship with time. And by, by trying to understand the human relationship with time and, and events in time, what I found is I was starting to understand things about how hope works. So feelings of, of hopefulness, 
And I also started to uh, get some good information, I guess, I think, about unconditional love and how that relates to time. And of course, as I was in the last 15, 20 years that I've been looking at this stuff, of course, I also came across, uh, discovered for myself, discovered precognition and started doing experiments in precognition, and which led me to remote viewing, precognitive remote viewing, which is the most validated form of precognition and the most re re replicable. And so um, I became interested in that and got trained in remote viewing from, John, uh, let's see, John Vivanco, which is, if you know Prue uh, Calabrese, her protege, and then, and then partner and business partner and um, in trans-dimensional remote viewing systems. And then sort of amended that as I wanted to for my own work and for my own teaching. And um, I'm now in, because I didn't really have any controlled remote viewing um, training, I'm now in a basic Lynn Buchanan controlled remote viewing training class, learning a lot of the structures that John taught me are very similar to those that Lynn is teaching. So I feel like, okay, good. You know, I'm not missing out on too much. Um, and I'm really super interested in how the culture of remote viewing is shifting uh, and how that has to do with it moving from the military out into the world. Um, and especially how women and men differently relate to remote viewing and uh, how that relates to how we teach remote viewing and how we do remote viewing. And so anyway, that's those are all sort of my remote viewing related interests. I have other interests, um, especially related to time travel. So I have this nonprofit, the Institute for Love and Time, TILT, which is about unconditional love and time travel because through using uh, remote viewing, I've discovered some apparently interesting physics effects and quantum mechanics um, related to, potentially related to time travel. So it's all kind of one big ball of wax. And uh, I'm here, I guess, because of all of these interests and so that we could talk about them openly. And if you had questions for me or if we just get into a conversation about this stuff, I'm, you know, the way I do things is I'm consistently a novice so that I can learn things. Um, so I, I don't ever like to be put into a position where I'm an expert because that's usually wrong. Like once, once I'm an expert on something, I get bored, right? So there's nothing to learn anymore. <laughs> so, um, so anything that you ask, I might, end up turning the question around to you. Um, but we might, um, I might know some things, maybe. I just don't know. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens, what kind of questions you have. You know, I'm definitely one of the least experienced remote viewers you'll talk to. I'm, I'm very good at it when I do it, you know, and my students are good at it and all this, but I'm probably, I've only been doing it for three years. I've only been doing it operationally for two years and, and very rarely at that, you know, not very many operational sessions. So it's more of an outsider's. It's like having a, like an ethnomusicologist who studies the culture and the world of music come to talk to a bunch of really amazing musicians. That's how this feels to me. So it's a different kind of perspective. Um, having said that, I've done some experimentation in the laboratory with remote viewing and have some insights from that that I can share as well. So, okay, that's my whole spiel. What do you want to talk about? Uh, I'd like to ask a question if you're inviting questions at this point. Um, first of all, you mentioned that uh, you had a background in cognitive neuroscience. I have trouble even reading the words I typed. Okay, can you explain a little bit what uh, what that is? Yeah, so it's kind of like the folks in the neuroscience field, the, the neuroscience field in the 90s and the late 80s became so huge that people started breaking off. I mean, trying to understand the brain was like the hottest thing in science at that time. And so people, there were, we would have these, you know, international conventions and there would be 20, 30,000 people attending. And someone, you'd meet someone, you'd say, wow, you're also into neuroscience. And what do you study? And they'd say, well, I study, you know, worm neurons and how they respond to different genetic tweaks. And you're like, wow, I can't even talk to you because I study, you know, how dreams work or whatever it is. And people started to realize there are these very different kinds of approaches to neuroscience and started to divide them into little sections. One of those sections is cognitive neuroscience. Cognitive neuroscience is like a bridge between what's going on in your mental state 
and what's going on in the brain. So it's trying to understand the relationship between essentially thinking or cognition. It can sometimes include perception, like what do you hear, see, taste, smell, um, touch. Um, it could sometimes include that, but more often, you know, like for instance, attention, intention, uh, perception, maybe action. These are sort of the things that the cognitive neurosciences are trying to explain. They're trying to map your ability, for instance, to remember what happened yesterday onto brain activity. So it was the closest thing that I could get to as a postdoc, the closest thing that I could get to that related to the mind, the, the stuff that I thought was really interesting is what is the mind doing? What, it, what does it mean to have a mind? What does it mean to think? What does it mean to have experience? What does it mean to have mental contents? And so that, those were the interesting questions to me. So when I did my postdoc, um, I went in that direction. And then after I finished my postdoc, I was like, yeah, I don't really don't care how the brain does this. I just want to look at what the mind can actually do. Like what are the limits to what the mind can do? So that's, does that help a little bit? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, um, let's see, what are the limits here? Let's see, bridge between the mental state and the brain perception, attention, intention, uh, what's the mind doing? Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, kinds of approaches, worm neurons. Care to say anything about what that is? <laughs> um, yeah, sure. There's plenty of people. Uh, so, so C. elegans is a species, a center of the ditus. Elegans is a species that um, was one of the first species where all of the neurons, I think they only have like 310 neurons. I, I don't know if that number is quite right anymore. Anyway, they only, they have a small number of neurons under a thousand. And it was one of the first species where all neurons were known, their positions in the adult were known. Um, and then they started to, to map the genes. So now they, then they had the whole genetic sequence of, of the C. elegans genes, these little worms, before they had the human sequence. So they could actually turn on and off genes during development and show how the little neurons would change it, it, as appropriate to the little shifts in the genes. And in fact, that's where some of the anti-aging work was first done. They found a gene that if they flipped it from its nat natural position, the worms would live three times as long. So a lot of the anti-aging people in humans say, well, wait a minute, if there's an actual gene that's making you age, like maybe we could actually flip that in humans. You know, of course the human genes don't exactly map to the worm genes because we have more and we have more than 300 or so neurons, um, but it was the start of a whole field. Um, yeah. Oh, in terms of pushing the potential to its limit. Yeah, sort of, I feel like we sort of um, decide that isn't the, we get, I think that there's a cultural thing where we get kind of fascinated with like, wow, the brain is so cool and it's so complicated. and. How does it do all this stuff and yada, yada, yada. But what we're forgetting is that the human mind itself, like the mental contents as opposed to the physical contents of the skull um, are profoundly underused, right? So they're profound, like we sort of settle for um, run of the mill uh, mental behavior and get super excited about this physical object in our skulls. And so the question is how do we push human use of the mind without even worrying about what particular circuits are, are making that happen um, so that we could actually use our minds to really open up to new ideas about, for instance, how to avoid conflict, how to create clean water all over the world. These kind of things we are humanly capable of doing, but we uh, kind of settle for this um, low level of functioning. Um, just to get by. And um, I don't think that's a good idea. So that's what that means. All right, thank you. Yeah. And uh, do I call on people, Daz? It's all right, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to them. Uh, Judy's got her hand up, so go next, Judy. Right, thank you. Um, how do you define the mind? And also, what about the central nervous system beyond the brain? and the reflex responses that we have that don't even involve the 
central nervous system directly? Yeah, that's why it becomes boring to start, at least to me, sorry for all neuroscientists, but it becomes boring to me to just start to focus on the brain because yeah, you have this whole gut nervous system, you have a nervous system in your heart, you have a nervous system spread through your entire body. Some people talk about a nervous system that reaches out of the body and is in contact with sort of the surround. Um, so all of that stuff is important. And what do I mean by the mind? How, how do I define the mind? I define the mind and that's why it's like kind of easier to not have to name all that stuff and just call it all the mind. That's how I define the mind is the contents of conscious experience. So experience you are aware of. So that includes ideas, memories, projections into the future, actual sensations of the future or the past, um, anything you're doing during remote viewing, anything you're doing during um, REM sleep or dream state. Right, and then it also includes the unconscious mind. So all the things you're not conscious of, which is a much, you know, if this is an iceberg, the conscious mind is just the tip, as you know, from remote viewing. The stuff down here, to me, is the super interesting stuff, the stuff you're not conscious of, and how you get the stuff that you're not conscious of to bubble up, especially during remote viewing or a directed dream, um, to bubble up so that you could consciously do something with it. That's, that's, that's the juicy stuff to me. Yeah. So when you think about people's beliefs that are quite often very unconscious, yeah. uh, being able to go beyond those beliefs to release stress around them, which is part of the work I do as a complement therapist. Cool. So are you on that? I, I think that's a great thing to do. Well, what else? I mean, I mean, well, we have these amazing minds um, that are dynamic and we can learn and we can shift and we can become aware of one piece of it. That's like a hologram. You can become aware of one piece of it and the other bits are a little fuzzy, but then you go over here and you shine a light on this. And now this part is very clear and the other bits are a little fuzzy. So I don't know, I'm not against any, I don't know how anyone could be against any modality that's about trying to shine a light on all these different pieces and, and show off the dynamics and, and bring the dynamics into um, of the mind into integration with what the, where the person wants to go in their life. So if that's what you mean, then how could one be against that? Okay, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where human potential comes from. I think Russell's up next with a question. Hi, Russell. Okay, hi, Julia. Hi. First of all, I, I would just love to thank you so much for this book. Oh, you like it? Thanks. Oh, and also, Iman Sparus was my co-author. Well, yeah, I and mean, I got a chance to meet him briefly at the 2018 Irva. But this cool. is, you know, this is such an incredible book, examining the things you do. One thing that's mystified me, so on page 89, how, what do you think the mechanism is for EMDR bringing about contact with Dead people uh, with beings with disincarnates yeah um yeah so the book he's talking about is transcendent mind rethinking the science of consciousness and the american psychological association so loved the work of my co-author iman sparus that he had done for them before that they asked him to write a write a book and they said whatever you want to write about so he said all right i'm writing about how the the mind is not the same as the brain and i'm writing about how the mind is in fact primary. And I wanna write it with this person, Julia. And I was like, great, I'll do it. <laughs> Cause that sounds like fun. So that's how I got in on that project. It was really Imanza's project that he brought me in, in on. And I really enjoyed that work. In terms of EMDR and how that can get people in touch with discarnates. So Russell is referring to a story in the book. I don't remember what page it was on but I bet I know the story where I was, is this the one where I was taken to the place and the guy did the wand and I yeah, saw my friend. It's page, it's page 88 and 89. And one um, was where they took, uh, they went to the Veterans Affair Hospital in Chicago. And then later in another part, uh, the MDR sessions would bring about some sort of receptive mode. And suddenly these people unexpectedly would become aware of disincarnates. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I was actually writing for a, uh, 
mind body health column at, at some point when I was just learning about this stuff. And so I went and did this myself. So what this is, is this guy, and he worked for Veterans Affairs, and he discovered that if he did the EMDR thing, which is just finding a way to have the eyes move quickly back and forth like this across the center line. It's, by the way, thought to help. It does help people with PTSD. On average, it's thought to help because you're integrating the hemispheres, but who actually understands it? I don't know. But in any case, um, um, he did this with me and my intention was to, he had me hold an intention as he was doing it. It was the simplest thing. He literally had a plastic stick with a red tape on it, on the end. It was like a magic wand. And he's like, this is all we do. And he just does this at a certain rate, which wasn't even very fast. And he had me hold the intention of seeing a friend of mine. And so who had died when I was in college. And I had always blamed myself for this friend's death because I had been flirting with him on the phone and he was at another college. And I said, oh, if you come up and dance at our DJ show, you know, maybe we'll go out afterwards. And yeah, I was kind of being seductive. And I felt like I drove him to decide to come in the middle of the night to come to our show. And, uh, and he was killed by a, by a truck driver who fell asleep and who was driving in the opposite direction. And um, it was really hard and I felt guilty. So it was years later and I wanted to see Jonathan. So, and I don't know what I called him in the book, but anyway, his name was Jonathan. And, um, and I did, it was simple. It was, it was so simple that I basically thought I was making it up. I mean, I had the intention of seeing someone that had died that person showed up when this guy waved his magic wand. Clearly, I made it up, you know, but there he was with, he was very happy, of course, which I could have made up because it would have made me feel better. And he said there were no problems and I shouldn't feel guilty, which I could have made up because it would make me feel better. And he was there with this, with this golden retriever, which I'd never seen before. So that was the only part that was like, huh, I don't know what the golden retriever is. So I went home I contacted his sister who was still alive and I told her about the experience and she said well it's interesting about the golden retriever um, after he died my parents got a golden retriever and he was killed on the road as well and I thought well that's super interesting because I didn't know that I had been out of touch with her and that was the part that made it feel like maybe I'm not making this up you know maybe either it's precognitive right? So there could be like a, a time loop so that I knew I would, there's some part of me knew I would have that conversation and, uh, you know, had a premonition about it. Or, um, you know, there's some kind of survival thing or some kind of information about the afterlife or whatever you want to call it. Or um, I read my friend's mind. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, you can't nail it down. That's an anecdote. So one of the yeah. things I've learned to do is there's a lot of anecdotes in the world. You can't nail it down. But in terms of how that might work, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, no, also, I'm familiar with EMDR. Yeah. I was just really yeah. surprised in this book. And mm -hmm. then they have that case of the Vietnam veteran who was mm -hmm. also able to reconcile the situation with someone he was uh, perhaps involved with killing. Oh, yeah. You know, so I just found it fascinating. So I, I guess like part of me, so if you're talking about your attention going from side to side, I guess I suppose that could integrate it. Mm -hmm. Or is it just giving your monkey mind something to do and you as a being can, you know, so, so I, I don't know. I, I just, always, that question has always nagged me. So I thought I'd take advantage. Um, yeah. So let me just, mind, oh, I'm sorry, go I, ahead. Oh, well, I just want to speak to that. So here's the thing I find what I find lovely about remote viewing and why I love to do it is because the part of me that wants to figure things out, like how does it work that EMDR, this eye movement thing could actually create that experience. That part of me that wants to figure that stuff out kind of has to go to sleep. It kind of has to take a seat behind the part of me that actually receives the information. So that's the same sort of shift that I made from doing neuroscience to now doing much more experimental psychology, behavioral psychology and physics, which is about 
um, like doing a lot of observation and not so much figuring things out. So I always ask the question when people ask me, how does this work? I always ask the question, the same question that was asked of me when I was in graduate school in neuroscience and it just floored me. So here's the question. I was talking with my stepmother and I was talking excitedly about how I had just figured out the genetic code for this particular protein that was on the, on the, um, on the membrane of one of the neurons of a cell. And um, she said, that's so cool. So I don't really understand what that gets you though. And I said, oh, well, if you understand the genetic code then you can understand the shape of the protein maybe. And then once you understand that you could understand you know, how, this, how the cell fires and communicates. And once you understand that you can understand you know, maybe how a whole circuit in the brain is processing information. She said, okay, good. What about when you understand that? I said, well, if you understand that then eventually we can map every thought and feeling and emotion onto these cells and the way they interact. And she's like, great. And then, and then what? And I was just silent <laughs> because I was like, well, but that would just be cool. And she's like, yeah, but what does that get you? Like, so say, you know, every single cell and exactly when it's firing with every single thought. So what? I was like, holy shit. <laughs> She slammed my entire, like I got it. I sunk to the floor. I remember where I was at that moment. I sunk to the floor on the phone, which still had a cord on it. Cause this was like 1993. And I just, I just I cried because I realized she was absolutely right. Like, where does it get you? It's interesting. Sounds so, like a Zen master. It is a little like that experience of like, oh my God, what I have wanted all this time is sort of an egoic pleasure of wanting to be the one who knows things. But what is that egoic pleasure? It's just feeling like I've mastered something or know something. What does that really get me? It gets me nothing. So that's um, the piece. That's the piece that I think comes up a lot in remote viewing. And that's why I end up working towards unconditional love and remote viewing, because I think that brings in a whole different element. Yeah, Does that make thank sense? Thank you very much. If Don doesn't mind, Don, do you mind if I ask one more question or do you want me to get in queue back behind you again? Okay. Um, first of all, too, also for the people that are interested, they have some nice uh, stuff in here about remote viewing in this book. I'll actually, because I stand behind this book a lot. I mean, it's one of the best ones I've read in a very long time. I'll put thank a you, link Russell. in. in Oh, it's just wonderful. And, and I love your co-author too, uh, when I met him. So the, the second question in, in your conversation about hallucinogenics and particularly LSD, it almost sounds like one of the theories under consideration is that it actually kind of causes the brain to quote unquote jam or malfunction, if you will, which gives the being an opportunity to separate from the body and perceive from there. Is that? Oh, I wouldn't call it jam or malfunction. So that, that part of the book is, is talking about this idea of um, that the brain has a filter on it that actually turns down our access to all the information. If we actually had conscious access to all the information, we couldn't handle it. Like it doesn't work, but that's not how we could survive. Not sustainable. It's like being on acid all the time, except you're actually getting veridical information about everything. So, so we, our brain actually has a filter that says, no, only certain things are gonna rise up to consciousness. And that's adaptive, it's good. It helps us not go crazy, helps us function. And if you take certain drugs, that filter can open up uh, a little bit. And the way it looks in the brain when people are taking certain drugs, is also that the filter has opened up. But interestingly, what that looks like in the brain is less activity and not more. Oh, okay. So it's so, almost like the brain is like, well, we'll just let this happen. It's almost like the brain itself, less activity means more awareness. It's like, that's so, like the brain itself being a filter. Okay, so, so then the, the model is more that the brain stops slough, uh, doing all of its work to slough information off. 
relaxes. Now you can actually see. And then the mind can become more active. Right. That's why I don't want to call it a malfunction because what's sure, the malfunction? Sure. Yeah, That's yeah, why yeah. I air quoted yeah. it. It, it, it. The way it was worded here kind of made me wonder, do, do, is it like if you, you know, messed up your radio and now you can talk to the DJ directly kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if so, you made your radio okay. better. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for this work. I, I hope people give it a chance. I mean, it's historical in that it's the first non-physicalist textbook approved by the American Psychological Association, but so many of the things we speculate about are addressed in here very clearly. So anyways, thank you, Julia. Wow, thank you, Russell. What a great, um, it seems like I might've planted you, but I, but I don't know you and it makes me feel good that you're no. still saying these kind things. <laughs> you, did not, you did not plant me. I only endorse things I believe in. Okay, cool. <laughs> Hi, Don. Don, you're up. Okay. Uh, you said uh, a bunch of interesting things here. And I just before I ask my question, um, I want to say that um, this thing about the filter in the brain, that is so interesting. Because as a remote viewer, I've done sessions where, for example, uh, I did a session on the uh, uh, President Lincoln assassination. And I was getting all of this data about uh, people uh, upset in a crowd and somebody standing on stage and uh, so carrying something down the steps, walking something across the street, a light on uh, all night uh, in a hotel. No gun, no assassination, no death, murder, blood, anything like that. All of that was filtered out. And uh, I'm just trying to, um, like, have you gained any insight on this filter, opening this filter? Um, working with this filter. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I noticed the same thing you do with myself and with my students. And I talk to other people who train remote viewing and do operational work and they see it as well, which is that the person's personality really helps you predict what kind of information they're gonna allow through and what kind of information they're not gonna allow through. And furthermore, what kind of information they're gonna take from one type of information and spit into another type of information that they can manage better. So someone's trauma history, for instance, um, will help, like for me, I have a trauma history, a physical trauma history. So there's certain kinds of traumas that if I'm remote viewing, I'll spin it into all of a sudden, I'll be like, well, isn't this a nice target? The kids are smiling and they're walking down the street. I'll just make us up some wonderful story about how these kids are having a great day when the kids are in fact being tortured, right? Um, that's because I'm not gonna let myself see that. And it's serving a purpose for me, which is I, you know, I, I'm not going to let myself be exposed to that. And at the same time, over time, I've noticed and over practice, I've noticed um, what works to really allow the information through is, first of all, continued practice. And second of all, this unconditional love piece. So what, to me, what widens the aperture, and so let me just explain what I mean by unconditional love because a lot of people don't talk about it in a remote viewing context. So I'm confident that I better explain what I mean. Um, so unconditional love is, I'm, as the way I define it, is not romantic love and it's not affiliation like I really like pizza and it's not platonic love. It is love that is not, um, produced by a human being, but is experienced by a human being. I'm not saying animals can't experience, but let's just talk about humans for now. It is experienced by a human being and it's a force that exists in the universe. So it's like a physical force. It's like if you walked into a room that had a bunch of light in, in it, you would be accessing light. And that's the way I like to think about unconditional love is walking into a room with a bunch of light in it. You're at, you don't have to generate it but you're feeling it, it's there. And what it, the feeling, and now, so that, I'll, that is the physicality of it. Now I'm gonna describe the feeling of it. The feeling of it is um, absolutely accepting and even loving all that is without the need for any kind of reward or return and without conditions on the thing that is loved. So it could be scary to people. And it is often associated with mysticism or, or religion. 
And now that people are starting to realize we can look at what goes on in mysticism and religion within the context of science and within the context of psychology, I'm really encouraging people to recognize you can actually study unconditional love as a human experience. It's a, it's a transformative human experience because um, once you take away these conditions about, well, I'm only going to love that person if they don't stab me in the chest or whatever your conditions are, right? Once you take those away, and I'm not saying that I'm always in that state, but when I'm accessing that state, once those conditions are taken away, the fear of receiving information that doesn't work for me, like, like with my trauma history, that any kind of torture, um, it goes away because I can't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of because I'm loving everything as it is. Plus I'm more capable of seeing what is there and accessing what is there. Because again, I'm not, I'm not afraid of any component. I don't have any judgment about it. it should be this, but it's that, right? And I'm unconditionally loving myself because you can't unconditionally love. You can't have the experience of unconditional love in my experience. I can't have the experience of unconditional love without unconditionally loving myself. Like it's not everyone else, but not me. It's me and everyone else. So, is, so that where, is that where you start then is like yes. loving yourself? Yes. And so and one then, thing, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, when, when people are just starting with a practice of unconditional love, there's two things I, I tell them to practice. So one is to find a part of your body that you feel really good about. Like I have no complaints about my fingers. So like, I don't sit there and think, oh, I wish my fingers were longer or shorter or more purple or whatever. I think they're fine, you know? So I start with my fingers and just see, spend a moment just loving my fingers and then start to grow it. You know, my arm, all the way back to my torso, up to my head, behind me, down through my back, my butt, my legs, my feet, and then inside all my organs. Even if I have pain, even if I'm sick, whatever, 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 <laughs> whatever's going on, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to, which is easier for some people, is to see something see a spot in the room and say, that's going to be in my little love shower area. And imagine at the top of that area, there's a shower head that's releasing just unconditional love. And you can, once it's all built up and it's maybe like 10,000 times more unconditional love than you think that you could stand, then you go over physically and you walk under that and you feel it. And it feels really good. So those are the two ways. Um, that I suggest people get used to this. The reason I suggest it in a remote viewing context is not only because in my experience and in my students' experience, it really helps allow yourself to have much better experience in your sessions and get really useful information. I actually did a controlled study on this and people who were experiencing unconditional love at the higher level, so on a scale of one to five, people who were at four or five on the scale were performing better than chance on remote viewing, even on a two minute remote viewing task and they'd never been taught remote viewing before. And they were significantly better than people who are on the lower end of the scale. So there's actual scientific reason behind it. Now I'm trying to replicate that with an online experiment with hundreds of people to see you know, how unconditional love relates. This was only 35 people, but the effect was big enough with 35 people that I was impressed that there's something going on here. Okay, thank you. I, um... Actually, I'd like to ask you the uh, question I really had for you now. Oh, that was, ask, well, always start with the real question. <laughs> uh, the, the real question was something you said in your introduction, and that was you started talking about time travel. I was uh, sort of, yeah. Yeah, an interest in time travel and the effects on time travel and uh, physical uh, relationships or whatever. Can you explain what that means? <laughs> um yeah, so I think of time travel as three. Since I was a kid, I've been obsessed with time travel. And I used to lie in bed and just think about how ridiculous it was that we put any research dollars into any other technology. Because once you have time travel, you have the time to solve all the other problems, right? So you have time travel, so you just put a bunch of scientists in your time machine and then let them go for 30 years and solve cancer. And two seconds later, they come out and cancer solved, right? So it's like, <clears throat> what is the problem here? This is clearly the most important thing. 
Um, <laughs> now that's not necessarily true, right? Because the poor, those poor scientists, they've just spent 30 more years of their lives locked in a time travel machine, but I guess you can make it nice. But anyway, um, I still think it's a really important thing. I think in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to see major uh, prototypes of uh, at least informational time travel, if not physical time travel. But let me break down what I mean by the different kinds of time travel. So I think that there's mental time travel, um, informational time travel, and physical time travel are the key ones. Mental time travel is what we do with precognitive remote viewing. So when the target's in the future, we're getting information from a direction of time that we're normally thought to not be able to get information from. So that's time travel, right? As opposed to remembering something in the past, even though the information has traveled over time, it's in the direction that we're used to. So I'm not calling that time travel, right? So that's mental time travel. Informational time travel is when you get information by the way, mental time travel can include informational time travel. You can get information through a non-mental modality. Like for instance, my big um, risk, risky adventure with informational time travel is I have a photon uh, optical setup. And I always look over here because that's where it is. You can't see it from where you are, but it's in my closet, in my home. And I do informational time travel experiments. So the idea is that the photons you can send a signal from the future to the past using a certain pattern of photons and the photons are actually communicating back into the past. So it's not a mental, not strictly a mental process, depending on how you think about what mental is, because it could include photons, right? So, but at some sort of colloquial level or common understanding level, it's a physics process that is getting information from the future, right? And then, and I'm not the only one doing this, like national labs in the US and in Russia are doing similar experiments. So there's a sort of a quiet little race towards mm. um, time travel. And then physical time travel, you take a physical object, let's say a watch, and you put it in some kind of time machine. This is what we're most used to in terms of science fiction stories. And then you can see that it's traveled backwards or forwards in time. Um, and maybe a person, you know? And if you put a person in a time machine, then you've got physical, you've got mental, and you've got informational time travel all at once, right? Because unless the person comes out and they're dead or they, they're still themselves but in terms of body, but they have no memory and no personality, um, they have to have taken their mental and informational capacities with them. So I sort of splice it up like that. The parts that I'm most interested in are the mental, and informational time travel. And I think ethical use of mental and informational time travel capabilities is gonna be a hot topic that no one's talking about. Kind of like right now, everyone's talking about the ethical use of artificial intelligence. People are thinking about that. They're worried about it. That's great. Doing some good things to try to deal with that. But there's not a lot of attention on making sure that the people who are using time travel are using it ethically. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Very interesting. Uh, Brett, I think you're up next for a question. Is he still there? Hi, Brett. We could hear you, or we can't. Well, can we hear you? Hey, no. Maybe he's gone. he's gone away for a while. Uh, uh, maybe we should let get Kiara do your question first. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. I'll oh, go ahead. Okay. Um, the problem is, is I've written down about seven questions. So I got to pick the first one. Okay. Uh, mm, that's hard. Well, first, a really easy one for you, uh, Julia. Well, first, a yes, no one, because that's nice and fast. Okay. You're familiar with uh, Diane Hennessy and the stuff she's doing? Yes, Diane Hennessy Powell. Has she, has she um, dropped the Powell? Uh, I just heard about her saw her in a, a Monroe Institute conference, so I don't know about the Powell. Okay. And uh, then the next question, uh, again, a really easy one. What did you learn about walking when you're talking? Because when I'm on these chats, I'm usually playing my piano and my guitar, and I, I put the camera out so it doesn't distract people. But I learned yeah. a lot of things about that. So my question to you is that, I guess. But I also have another four that I'm going to ask later. Okay, walking and talking. I've learned that some people can get a little seasick when the background doesn't move, when, when I'm not cha changing the background as I move. 
Um, but I also learned that that's related to some kind of eye movement stuff that goes on for people. Um, and so that's really interesting in itself. And I learned that if I slow down, not, see, I'm doing, I'm, I'm being really easy on you all because normally at a meeting, I would go something like, I'll show you the pace that I would go. Um, much faster, like I break a sweat, probably about 3.8 miles an hour like this. Um, but I'm not gonna do that because I think <laughs> it could cause seasickness. But what I learned is that I function much better when I'm moving, it allows me to um, keep my train of thought and slow down my thinking so that I could communicate clearly. I have a problem of, of thinking very quickly and not being able to um, talk slowly when I'm not moving. So I put some of my energy for thinking into my legs and then that allows me to communicate better. Okay, yeah, Brett, I, I have my mic working. Here? Yeah, I just had the wrong mic selected. Hopefully you can hear me. <laughs> yeah, hey, Julia. Brett. Yeah. So uh, just a pretty straightforward question, I think, but you're talking about the uh, Wait, can I time you out for a second, Brett? Sure. Are you the Brett that I worked with on that one dream? Uh, yeah, in 2017. Yeah, yeah we, okay. we spoke. Yeah, it's nice to, nice to talk to you again, Julia. I forgot your last name. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, no worries. But uh, just a really simple question on the remote viewing and unconditional love. You said you're running, you ran an experiment with 35 people. Now you're doing a larger online one. Um, I was curious what, uh, what's the method, methodological approach you're taking to that? Like as far as the steps, are you having the viewers go through like a 30 minute cool down using that five minutes? Like what are you having them do that you're making sure it's consistent across viewers that you're testing for? I'm curious about your, the steps that you're putting into place. Yeah. So no steps. This is a, this is a simple survey experiment. So here we're going to give um, you a definition of unconditional love. To what extent are you feeling that right now? Boom, boom, boom. Let's do a remote viewing task. I'm going to have a brief video that just tells you what remote viewing is in case you don't know it. Totally novice people for the most part. You're just going to try to guess what's in the picture. Probably not going to guess. It's going to be horrible. Why would you even do this? Okay, let's just go for it. And then they do it and then correlate their performance. Use independent judges to judge mm -hmm. and then correlate the independent judges ratings of their sessions these, uh, versus the actual targets um, as a correlator for the feelings of unconditional love. So Got it. Okay. At first we were gonna do an immersion technology because we worked with a hypnotist and got a whole um, unconditional love suggestion going that seemed to work. But then we realized, no, not online, because we can't be sure they really do it. Cool. Do you know when you'd have the uh, results of that? Or how long is that going on for? We would have to start to the experiment. <laughs> oh, it hasn't <laughs> started yet. Right Got now it. we're doing the programming. Got and then it. we're going to run Amazon Mechanical Turk people. And we'll probably present the results at a conference in spring of 2022. Probably like Science of Consciousness or um, SSE. Okay. Um, the, science, uh, the, the Society for Scientific Exploration. Cool. Thanks, Julia. Yeah. yeah nice to see you or your picture. Yeah, same. <laughs> Andra, uh, you have a question you want to ask next? Mute. Hi, hi, Julia. Hi. My name is Andra. I'm a huge fan of you. Um, I, I'm going to. I'm going to try not to babble too much here. Um, I'm really new in remote viewing. Um, I actually only kind of came into it maybe a year and a half ago um, after having a huge fight with my best friend about whether or not remote viewing even exists. Um, but it, I came into it with such um, knowing that uh, as soon as I proved myself right. I said, this is what I'm doing for a living. I'm switching careers. Um, however, I, I, I really do have some questions as I'm building up my confidence to even interact with this illustrious remote viewing community. Um, I, I actually only, I didn't really have what I considered psychic abilities until 
uh, 10 years ago, I got sober and then almost immediately, like within just a couple of months, um, you know, things started happening, knowing started coming. And each year it's just gotten stronger on its own with me doing nothing. Um, a couple of years ago, I went to Paris and I met someone. And um, when I came back, I found out that I had perfect telepathy with this person um, and I'd never had such a thing before. Um, so much so that this person almost said they needed to cut communication with me because they couldn't have me seeing what uh, he does for a living. The, yeah. the point I'm getting to is, um, and I, I realize this is sort of a tortuous path. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting at an intersection with my friend and I just said, there's going to be a terrorist attack. That's all I said. Um, and it was two days later that the news here said, and this is the way they framed it, was a terrorist attack in Mozambique. That is the third time this has happened to me with regard to a terrorist attack. Um, and it really does tie into this person who I met, et cetera. Um, it also ties into what you were saying earlier about um, who you might meet along the road uh, in, this, in this travel. I was watching last week's remote viewing session and a woman was saying how, you know, she would just go up to someone and, you know, sort of interact with them. She apparently woke someone from the dead. Um, I am the person who, if anything wants to find me or target me, they will, because I'm just like an open, I'm a cancer. I'm like wide open. Um, so whether it, has to do with things more uh, mystical or political. Um, how would you suggest preparing and protecting oneself? I, I know that Daz said that Russell had done some shamanic work to be able to separate from this. I, I also have done a lot of shamanic work um, I've also done EMDR um, for trauma. How, how would you, what advice would you give to, to really be able to protect oneself from, you know, who's seeing me, who knows I'm here? Because um, I, I, I did have the experience once where someone who was, and this is only my experience, was killed in ISIS territory there spirit went through me as they left. Um, it was the strangest experience ever. And it, I, it just happened and I kind of wish it hadn't. Um, how, do, how do we protect ourselves from this? Especially if I want to pursue something like um, remote viewing as it pertains to AI. Okay. That's my question. <laughs> all right, no, and it, uh, just to be clear, um, you needed to go through all of that to get your question out. So it didn't feel meandering to me like you were, like you were telling me all the context. Okay. So, yeah. Um, and um, I don't know the answer of how to protect yourself because I think it's different for each person and you have to, but I think that it, 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 at a meta level, the question is how, how much are you prioritizing protecting yourself? And I would suggest that you make that the top priority rather than like, well, I'm gonna do remote viewing, but how do I protect myself? I would suggest you flip it and say, I'm gonna protect myself. Now, what can I do given that I'm protecting myself? That is the best and most obvious answer. I can't believe that I didn't, <laughs> it never would have occurred to me without you saying that. I don't know if it's the best or most obvious, but I'm, oh, I think, I'm glad I think you find it helpful. Yeah, I really feel like um, one, sometimes I've done these sessions where I say my goal isn't to get information about the target on this session. It's a practice session. My goal is to feel in love with myself through, through the entire session. That's my goal. And so I'll have succeeded if I did that. And maybe I'm not even going to look at the target or maybe I'm you know, going to look at it, but remember that that was my goal. Um, I think that especially for people who are very permeable, uh, my husband is this way, just like profoundly permeable. 
um, energetically or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think learning to put energy out. So unconditional love is super helpful here. If you can be like a flashlight of unconditional love, you become pretty uninteresting because there's no drama. Right? Someone shows up and there's like, I want to scare you or find out what you're doing. And you're like, hi, I love you. How's it going? And they're like, oh. I have your app and I'm getting pretty good at loving that robot. But, oh, yeah. Good. but I, you know, yeah, if, if it were someone who, uh, you know, or sex trafficking or something, I, ooh. but yeah. you know, that's a good practice for me as a human being. So. Yeah. And so then different. So then the next step is, especially if you have a trauma history, the next step is to differentiate between unconditional love and putting yourself in harm's way. So Remember, you're unconditionally loving yourself and others, which means if you put yourself in harm's way, that's not, that's not unconditionally loving yourself. And so you can unconditionally love someone who's a sex trafficker and still lock them up and make sure they never come out of jail. Thank you. Right? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. We have some questions in the chat, so I'll read a couple at the moment. One's from Ida. She asks, have you studied trauma-induced adverse experiences effect on cognitive development? Because some studies indicate that cognitive and emotional processing are disrupted at the age of traumatic experience. And she says she's a retired psychotherapist. Yeah, um, I haven't studied that um, intently as a psychotherapist would because I don't have that clinical psychology background. So I really... I think clinical psychology is perhaps the hardest thing you can do well. Um, and so I was raised by two clinical psychologists. And so I oh. have a lot, I have a lot of, I know, which is trauma in itself. And I have a lot of um, sort of implicit training uh, just in the water through listening to their conversations about clients. So I have a little understanding about that, but I've never studied it. But I, what I do know is that people can heal whatever happens to the brain during trauma, which certainly is something, right? Every single event that occurs has an impact on the brain. So trauma certainly does. But whatever happens to someone's brain during trauma, there can be healing from it. And what I've been studying is how to use time travel narratives to heal trauma. So how to um, create, t I'm creating technology that can help people see themselves extended through time so that they, they have feel like they have access to their past selves and their future selves. And so they can talk to their six year old child who went through a trauma and connect lovingly and help repair that and not feel that all is lost because it happened in the past. I think this cultural thing we have about time where we say if something happened in the past, there's nothing we can do about it is dead wrong and it gets in our way of healing and moving forward. So that's what I would say about that. I don't know oh, if that okay. answered your question. Daz, can I, can I follow up with a, okay. Um, the reason I ask that is, and then you brought up, when people bring up the concept of unconditional love, especially with somebody who's been traumatized uh, or, hasn't had quote unconditional love whatever that means to you or anyone else uh, the only time now personally because I was in a death experience when this happened but that was the time when I felt the most amazing unconditional love experience was you know in going through that tunnel and uh That, uh, I mean, that changed my outlook on everything, even in subsequent experiences. So when you bring up unconditional love, I was very interested in hearing your definition. And then you're saying you're going to ask people how they feel about unconditional love. And uh, I mean, that was, I, I've been sitting here wiggling. My, I'm, I'm a twitcher. I, I'm wiggling my feet, you know, going, how is she going to do, how is she going to define that? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, first of all, I, I know what you mean about that unconditional love feeling um, I'm, I'm, and um, how powerful it is. 
and I'm going to find my paper um, and just tell you how we defined it in the paper. We've done several studies, one with, here it is, final paper. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Can I share my screen? Okay. This is the paper, by the way, if you wanna Google it. I think you have to have a um, blah, blah, blah. I think you have to have a um, subscription, but you might be able to, here it is. No, that's not quite it. Ah, here we go. We asked four additional questions that were based on a definition of unconditional love that was repeated for each question. Unconditional love is a heartfelt benevolent desire that everyone and everything, ourselves, others, and all that exists in the universe reaches their greatest possible fulfillment, whatever that may prove to be. This love is freely given with no consideration of merit, with no strings attached, with no expectation of return. And it is a love that motivates supportive action in the one who loves. So that's how we defined it. And okay, we did that in you. that study and in a study with a robot that we were trying to find out if people felt unconditional love with Sophia the robot. We used the same definition. Yeah, you're welcome. Excellent. Uh, and the next question in the list here is from Cedric. He says, classical cognitive neurosciences define intuition solely as a product of the physical brain. With your RV background, do you agree with this view? Well, first of all, I don't think anything, I don't think the brain produces anything except for like a lot of different ions and some waste. Um, so no, I would not agree with that. I don't think the brain produces um, so that's part of why I uh, helped write that book, Transcendent Mind. Um, the brain has a relationship with the mind for sure. If you know anyone who has any kind of neurological condition and, and you understand what's going on with their brain, you can get it that there is a relationship between the brain and the mind. So it's not like there's no, no relationship, but the relationship isn't um, in my view, and I don't even think there's much evidence for, for other views. Um, I think the evidence very much supports that the mind and the brain have a relationship with what that is not causal, kind of like the way, um, like an algae uh, on a tree, they have a relationship, the tree and the algae. But it's not like the algae is producing the tree or the tree is producing the algae. And yet if you, if you change one, the other one will change in response because they have a symbiotic relationship. So um, yeah, definitely not a fan of the idea that the brain produces the mind. I don't think, I also don't think there's a lot of evidence that the mind produces the brain. Um, so you might call me a dualist in the sense that I think there's mental things and there's physical things and they have a relationship. Um, but I also don't necessarily believe in causation as something that's really real. So I don't know that trying to track down what thing causes the other thing really benefits us. I hope that was clear. I was pretty, I was pretty ethereal as an answer. But anyway, I hope that you got your question answered. And if you didn't, could you try again? Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is a question for me, really. Um, we see a lot of uh, PhDs out there like uh, Edwin May uh, saying that he, and Joe McMichael saying that they believe that uh, all remote viewing is, is just precognition. Did you have any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, Ed May thinks that all psychic abilities are precognition, that's his big theory. Yeah. Um, maybe he's right, I disagree, in that it's really hard to imagine how um, something like psychokinesis could be precognition. Now Ed May has an, ex uh, an explanation for that. Um, so, so the four psychic abilities that that are generally studied um, are clairvoyance, precognition, telepathy, and psychokinesis. The fifth one, mediumship, a lot of researchers think is controversial because they think it's just a combination of these other ones and it's not actually talking to dead people. Um, I direct you to the Windbridge Institute and to the Windbridge Research Center if you want to learn more about mediumship as its own modality. But um, so Ed May deals with the, the four clairvoyance, telepathy, psychokinesis, and precognition. 
in his theories. And so he's trying to explain all four of these psychic manifestations or psychic abilities from the precognitive standpoint. Um, so clairvoyance, I think, is pretty uh, easy to explain from a precognitive standpoint because oftentimes the person who's being tested for clairvoyance is eventually told what the target was. It's hard to find an experiment in which the person wasn't. So clairvoyance is just receiving information that no one knows at the time or that someone might know. That has to be in order in the laboratory. It has to be some no one else knows. And then in the future, someone knows. So, okay, I could say that could be precognition. Telepathy, again, in the telepathy experiments, you've got two people, like a sender and a receiver. I put in air quotes because who knows if they're sending or receiving anything. But in any case, um, you have a target that's trying to be communicated. And eventually, usually the receiver is told what the target was. So they could be looking into their future precognitively, right? Psychokinesis, where the mind is trying to, where the intention is to use the mind to influence movement, whether it's movement of a stock market or of a digital, any kind of digital asset or just bits or the movement of an object. Um, now, Ed May says that the way that works, first of all, he doesn't believe that macro PK works. So he doesn't believe that you can use the mind to move larger objects. So he takes that completely out of consideration, um, which makes sense for his model because it's extremely hard to explain how someone could lift something with their mind um, using precognition. So he just then narrows it down to like little digital bits that you could change. And he says, you choose the particular moment precognitively according to what will succeed. So that's the way he kind of narrows it down. And uh, that one trick of saying, okay, I'm just gonna ignore macro PK. I understand why he does because it's very hard to verify, but it has been verified um, by at least by people I trust. So maybe I'm wrong in trusting those people. And so that's why, that's one reason. And the other reason I don't go for that is because I just finished analyzing, like for six months, I just sat and analyzed and analyzed and analyzed a bunch of data from this, uh, this app that I had talked about or someone had talked about called Psi3. It used to be called PsiQ. Now it's called PSI3, the number three for the iPhone. And we got a bunch of data, more than a million trials. And it, certain, it looks like there's a gender dynamic where men are more likely to use psychokinesis and women are more likely to use precognition um, or different strategies. And so because there's that different, it makes me feel like there's not one answer. I think it's too simplistic to say there's one thing going on. I think it, I understand why he does. He's a physicist in training and he's trained to try to make simplifying assumptions so that things could be understood in a simple way, understood in a simple way. But when physicists get into psychology and what the, the human mind can do, they're often, my father was a physicist. So the two clinical psychologists are my mom and her partner. And my father was a physicist. And I noticed his simplifying assumptions got in the way of his capacity to understand things. And I think that might be going on here. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's interesting. And it makes sense to me when you, when you put it like that. Um, something I've been talking about with people online this last, literally just this last week is uh, I'm finding that, you know, because we don't have any uh, mechanism yet towards what is happening with remote viewing and everything, everything lumped together in, in those subjects. Um, it seems to be, and it's, it seems strange to say this, but it seems to me that it's almost as if the, the mechanism behind how we get our information has its own consciousness because it almost has like a trickster effect. You, you think you've got it. You think you're there with your experimentation and you know what's happening. And then it completely reverses on you and does something totally out of the blue. It's, it's very strange, but yeah, I'm almost coming to the belief system that there's, there's something, something almost alive going on here, something conscious. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that it, I think it's the universe's way of training us not to get too comfortable with our feeling like we've mastered something. I, I think this idea of mastery 
which so many people go into remote viewing with, okay, so if I just do this and this, and then they change something and it works really great for a couple months. And then it, you know, just like we have all experienced that, that feeling of mastery does not put us in the position relative to the rest of the universe that is going to be beneficial. And what does put us into the position relative to the rest of the universe that is going to be beneficial is this experience of unconditional love. So instead of needing to master something and pin it down, um, it drives us towards this experience of, it is what it is, I'm part of this, I'm part of this system. The things that are occurring to me are the things that are occurring to me. And that's because they're the things that need to be occurring to this part of the system. And I don't understand it and I don't know why. And I trust and love it. That's a whole different state. And so I think that it's, it's almost like the universe is pushing us to stop with this behavior of, I got it, I got it. Like, are you kidding me? It's like the, it's like the universe is a quilt and we're on the wrong side of the quilt, the side that you don't show anybody. And, and there you see all the little knots going many, many different places. And there's no way to really understand what it would look like on the other side. But we claim to see what it's look, looking like on the other side. Yeah, no, you don't. No one does. It's too mysterious. It's okay. That's not our job. So that's where I'm at with it. It's hard though, isn't it? Because, you know, we are striving to... Um to push the boundaries with this and, you know, to, to develop it and try to get, you know, we all want to get, you know, to be hitting the target a hundred percent every time. To, and to do that, you need, you kind of need to know a little bit how the mechanism works so that you can tweak it. So I don't knowing know that that's true. Is it, I know that it's true that many of us want to get to be a hundred percent, but I don't know that it helps to know the mechanism. Well, it's like, how, if it's like, I see it like having an engine in a car. If I knew how the engine worked, I might be able to tweak it to run faster. I don't. So I can't. Yeah, but also you could tweak it and run faster without knowing what works with it. So in other words, um, um, you know the behavior of the car. Even if you don't understand how an engine works, there's all these other parts of the car too, right? Mm -hmm. So you maybe notice if you continue to observe, you may maybe notice that on Thursdays when it's been sitting around for two days and you haven't gone anywhere, all of a sudden it behaves in a, in a much more um, lumpy way that you don't like. So then you learn, okay, I don't know anything about how this car works, but I learned that perhaps I don't leave it sitting around for 48 hours. You know what I mean? It's just um, the trial and error teaches us sometimes better because people are unique and people's interactions and, and ways of being in the world are unique. Sometimes the trial and error with ourselves teaches us more than understanding some kind of idealized version of what's true for everyone. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Any of you guys? Uh, yeah, I've got a voice? question, Des. Yeah, go Can for I? Yep. Oh, hi, Julia. Um, um, I, I'm, I want to try and put something across and say it in an intelligent way, but I might not be able to. So oh, good. I, want, <laughs> I wanted to talk about the, the thing that uh, of being body based. So my, one of my jobs is as a, it's like a bodywork therapist. It's called, the discipline is actually called biodancer. And with, we work with the bodies to arrive at the unconscious emotions that are, um, that are stuck or um, hidden inside. You get to the emotion by working with the body. And oh. we do it by uh, exercises. So by walking, walking is one of our fundamental exercises, by the way, Yay. and music <laughs> and a group. So it's the, like the context of a group. And um, we call that positive eco factors because when you're in a secure situation, then you feel uh, it's easier to to contact your emotions. Um, and one of the things we base ourselves on is that neuroscience says that um, if uh, movement actually springs from emotion, it's actually the emotion that, that uh, allows it to, to flow. So, and then that ties up with remote viewing. And, and Lynn says it in his videos. Um, I saw your name on, on Lynn's site as well. I'm also there. Um, uh, Lynn uh, has always said that remote viewing is a body-based discipline and that your first handshake is, that's your ideogram, so you're connecting with your unconscious 
through your body. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that, but I wanted to say one other thing. When you were talking about the time, it was a fascinating. We're loving the films, by the way. Um, and your oh, the superpower thing. Yeah, they're oh, fa- good. I've watched every single one, and one of the most fascinating things, and you've just said it this evening, is about going back in time and uh, contacting your past self. But that sounds like actually magic. Uh, whoever works in the magic field, there seems to be a big crossover right now um, with like esoteric practice, uh, results-based magic. You do work on a timeline and you go back and Lynn actually teaches that. He says yeah. you can influence yourself um, to go back into the past and say that's a wrong decision that you made and yeah. so you get that feeling in the past and you go oh oh and you don't do, you feel like oh oh I shouldn't be there yeah so, and that's a body based thing as well so yes. would you talk some more about that yeah I think it's all a body based thing I mean so I think that we sort of have turned the body into I think the behaviorist sort of worldview of the last 100 and so years has turned the body into this idea of that it's a machine, it's just a biological machine. And the problem with that view is it ignores that this incredible capacity, I almost think of the body as this, um, it's inside, our thinking about it is inside out, like actually inside our body, I keep doing this with my hands, I don't know if this shows it or not, but inside our body is where the sensory apparatus is for the entire universe. And we're used to outside being like, oh, I touch something that's outside of me and it comes into my brain. But in fact, inside, at the core of who we are over time, in our extended self over time, at our core, so at the core of who we are in time and space, is this capacity to sense into the universe. So again, it's backwards. I mean, so it's like if you take one of those, uh, do you know those little toys for dogs that have the little uh, rubber points on them, like balls that are covered in these little nubs, right? So we often think of ourselves as that, like we have our sensory apparatus on the outside and we're walking around and sensing all this. But in fact, the sensory apparatus is inside and it's contiguous with the entire cosmos, right? So um, it's not that the outside isn't a sensory apparatus, it's just that it's not tuned into as much as the inside is. So when I'm doing remote viewing, I mean, this is not something that Lynn taught, but this is something that John taught. I definitely like to stand up and I call it merging and I'll merge with different elements of the target and I'll act out what's going on or I'll feel what's going on. And then I'll write it down in my transcript. Um, I feel like my body's like an antenna and it works better when I'm standing up than when I'm sitting down. So it's like I'm longer. Um, I don't, I can't validate any of that. I'm just telling you about my experience as a remote viewer and not, this is non-scientific. This is just my experience as a remote viewer, but that's my experience as a remote viewer. So. Can, can I just comment on that? Um, I've just done in a, in a um, practice group, a difficult target that could have been um, um, in some way protected so that viewers couldn't see it. And the, our targeter uh, said to us, um, he gave us a second, like a retasking. And in that retasking, I, I can't say it word for word, but he said something like, go back five minutes to before you did that session and um, redo it uh, knowing that you have full confidence in yourself and that you can go. And I actually drew exactly what you've just uh, showed with your hands. And I said, it's like a thyroid shape. It's like a thyroid and it has light streaming through it. But I drew that exact uh, shape that you drew. So there's definitely something in it. Well, either that or I was reading your mind. So like, that's the thing, one of the most, (laughs) no, no, no. I mean, like that's, so good remote viewers are also very telepathic and good remote viewing teachers are mostly telepathically communicating what they're communicating to their students, right? And so I know that I have that capacity. And so one of the things we have to be careful of is that we don't draw conclusions about things that don't have actual feedback based on multiple people coming up with the same thing, because a good telepath will come up. And also I'm, I'm also a leader and I'm six feet tall 
And so whatever I'm thinking tends to be kind of a beacon. Um, and so, and, and also, uh, yeah. So all, there's all those things going on. So you have to like, that's why you have to do science if you really want to find out the answer. And, and you may not want to find out the answer. You may just want to use it because it works for you and that's perfectly fine, you know? So. Yeah, my, my science, the science that I'm interested in is when intuition comes from if it's the same source as creativity, but now I'm going off the subject of it. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said. A lot of the results for how to induce creativity are related to intuition. It's, um, it's an upwelling of whatever's not conscious and how you manage that upwelling and how you use that fruitfully. And that's really the difference. Yeah, yeah. But it's just the upwelling. Yeah. And in terms of the going back in time stuff, yeah, there is this relationship with magic. I think magic sometimes has a bad name. So I just like to say, I mean, this is just simple stuff. Like conceptually, it's so simple. We have internal representations of ourselves at different ages in our life. And we have internal representations of ourselves in the future. And you can either ignore those or you can work with those. And if you ignore those, that's fine. And if you work with those, you'll get a lot of benefit. So that's the way I think of it. So it's not, nothing too fancy or esoteric. It's just like, you're thinking about it anyway. You, you, know, you remember when you were three anyway, and you have fantasies about what's gonna happen on your deathbed anyway. You might as well, you know, tell a little story about that in your head. Not a problem, <laughs> you know? I see all sorts of chat things and questions. Is there anything um, controversial or interesting that, that we need to talk about there? Yes. It's just it's just guys sharing information with each other at the moment. There's there's no hard questions okay. there. Uh, okay. On your the standing up thing, I just want to say that um, something that came out of working with Farsight is when we when they start getting us to do RV live on on whiteboards standing yeah. up. Um, I actually found that uh, that had an, a really amazing kinesthetic effect uh, yes. for our, for remote viewing because you know you were literally stood up moving around all the time and because your arms are moving on the whiteboard and you, know, you got video cameras watching you all that kind of stuff it really did help generate uh, new streams of information I think it's really yes. beneficial I saw your video I think you did the um, JFK assassination without knowing it was the JFK assassination yeah 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 that was beautiful and I could see you experiencing that standing up thing. Yeah. They're so, you know, so when we're sitting down in a classroom, we have all these associations with sitting down. John Pavaco talks about this in his training. I also think, I literally think of our bodies as antennas. So I really think it helps. But like, I wanted to do a little sample of what I mean when I'm talking about merging. So, um, so that was a good segue. Ugh, I probably shouldn't use my teeth to do that. Um, yeah, okay, good. All right, can you see me on the whiteboard then? Yeah, okay. So what I would do if I was um, working with a whiteboard and merging at the same time, so this is this physical process. Let's say I'm in a session and I'm describing a person. Okay, um, so the first thing I do is I sense into it. I'm like, this is a human, this is a male, scruffy and congenial. And then I want more information about that person, but I don't want to take on the person's, um, you know, I want to be careful. I don't want to take on the person's like who they are. I want me to be me and for the person to be the person. But at the same time, I want more information about what's going on with the person. So what I might do is say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and merge with the person. I'll repeat the tag 1194-1138. And um, so I'm going to merge with the person, but with the caveat that I'm merging with my safe image of the person, it's accurate, but it's a model of the person in my head. It's not their actual energy. So that way, it's like I have a model of the universe in my mind. This is a, this is a Lynn Buchanan way of thinking. I have a model of the universe in my mind. I'm merging with that aspect of the universe. So now this is 1194 with 1138. And what does my body, my body want to do? My body wants to um look up like there's a wanting there's a there's a looking up like just to stretch my neck to look up i don't know if that's my body or this person's body um ah okay so let me just shake that off 
And this person wants to have a lollipop. So it's like there's an incredible desire to just have a little red lollipop because it's such a treat. And so that's what's going on for this person. This is a grown man who wants a lollipop. Like one of the kinds that you would get from the doctor after seeing the doctor and you get an injection. So, um, so yeah, that's my feeling. And then I would just unmerge, um, make sure that I don't walk home with any of the stuff from that person. So that's, that's what I mean. And you know what I mean, Daz, Daz, I think that was similar to your experience, yeah? Yeah, yeah, definitely similar. Um, but yours seems uh, a bit more structured and it's, uh, it would be an interesting idea to um, incorporate that as a standard part of remote viewing because I, I, you know, pretty much 90% of what I do RV wise is sat down, at, sat down at a table nowadays. I don't do so much on whiteboard. So it would be, you know, it might be beneficial to get up, walk around, really get the, the whole body into the process a bit more like it does on the whiteboard rather than just sit, sitting there on, on, on your butt kind of thing. Yeah. It's yeah. Like sometimes I like build a vortex and I'll tell myself if I go through the vortex, if I'm having trouble connecting with a target, I'm like, look, I'm just going to go through the vortex. And when I'm done with the vortex, I'll see the target. I'll be at the target. So I just make that up in my head. And then I imagine a vortex in front of myself and I physically kind of climb into the vortex. Mm -hmm. And then I open my eyes that my eyes are actually closed, but I open my sort of internal eyes and um, I'm often capable of getting really cool information that way. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, sounds like a good approach. It. Yeah. Cause yeah. you know, I also don't do a lot of uh, CRV in, in station, you know, modeling and stuff cause getting the modeling clay out and all that kind of stuff. I just don't have time for that. So I could almost do a kinesthetic approach of that just by Model standing up. And, yeah. yeah. Using, using my body. Cause that's what the, that's what the modeling is all about anyway, is using yeah. your body to, generate new information kinesthetically so yeah yeah that's a good yeah. idea thanks for that yeah yeah the john vivanco is the big thank john vivanco <laughs> i think ki I, was up first for that question hopefully it's a really simple question and and uh coral started it really well and you just like just went right into it and we so we got to see some my question is how do you teach ideograms when you're teaching a class because i've tried teaching too yeah. uh, how do you teach that to them yeah. So I once, I, John and I taught together at first because I was insecure and didn't know if I could teach alone. And so we started his way of just doing the usual, like fill a page with, you know, for me, this is a living being, living being, living being, living being, living, you know, just have the students say it in their mind or out loud as they're doing it and fill up pages and pages. And then when I was in Lynn's class, um, I used his, he has software that arbitrarily randomly says things like living being landform water fluid landform living being space and sky and so you can record your own voice and have it be your voice asking your subconscious to produce these things and i have students do that but i'm not a controlled remote being trainer yet so i don't tell them i'm a controlled remote being trainer because i'm not but i have them do the ideograms um with and then sometimes i have them do it like uh, orchestra conductors so with their hands, forget the pen. So their whole body's into it. Water, landform, dead being, you know, whatever their symbols are. But I, I try to, what I do now is I, I sense into the students and uh, both explicitly and ask them, but also sort of psychically. Uh, my treadmill's on strike. Um, sense into them and see what's gonna work for them because depending on the students, if I have a bunch of engineers and doctors and people who are used to being incredibly left-brained, like I was, ideograms could be harmful as the first thing because they'll try to get perfect with the ideogram and then they'll try to guess consciously the ideogram and they won't let their pen do it. They won't get into the body, it'll all be mind. And so then I teach them just don't even learn an ideogram, just make a squiggle and sense into it and see what it feels like. And then with other groups of people who are really artistic and are used to need some kind of discipline, those are the ones I'm more likely to teach to do this sort of rote thing. So it's like, you know how it is when you're teaching remote viewing, there's the folks who need to learn to like tame their storytelling creative capacities because they'll just run away with it. And then there's the folks who need to learn to allow those stories to come out because they're used to suppressing it. And there, I think there's different te teaching techniques for each. So ideogram for, okay. 
Uh, Russell's up next. We have a question. Actually, I had two uh, two quick things and then a comment. Uh, one, Andra, I put a, a private message response to you in the messages. And then Daz, in terms of kinesthetics, do you ever use air modeling? On very rarely. Uh, I have one, once or twice, but I, I don't do it as standard, but I, I, I should do more of it, I think. Well, um, when Paul started teaching us uh, stage three, he, he, we would clear the desk, set our paper and pen off to the side and literally reach out and, um, you know, feel and then try to represent those shapes, just vague shapes. And then kind of your technique of evolving. And I found that like, uh, in fact, I, I had a, a session monitored by Brett where I had to yank my hands back because I felt like they had been burned. And it turned out that the, the target was a volcano. So there were some really interesting uh, effects. And then on to the comment, uh, or actually question slash comment for Julia. Have you read uh, Ingo's Resurrecting the Mysterious? No, I only started hearing about Ingo Swan after sort of my introduction to remote viewing. So I got a lot of flack from my book, The Premonition Code, because which, which I wrote with Teresa Chung, but I did the section on, you know, precognitive remote viewing. And uh, because I didn't mention Ingo, and, you know, that's like a big no-no in the world, apparently. So oh, well, <laughs> I'm only just now being introduced to Ingo, but I haven't yet read that book. I read... Um, the reason I ask is because he... That other one. ...talks about the integration of the body, um, what we call as the mind, and then the being themselves who's operating the mind to operate the body and then the communication flow between, you know, the, the triad, if you will. There, I think there's some things in that book in particular that, that you might find very interesting given the descriptions you've given. Probably. I mean, I find Ingo very interesting generally. What a quirky guy. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, resurrecting the mysterious. And what it is is a gentleman named Nick Cook uh, got access to Ingo's archives and they found uh, two primary unpublished manuscripts um, that he had set aside and they took and with uh, Ingo's niece, Ellie, um, put them into a, a manuscript and tried to balance and integrate it. But I think some of the topics you hit on, you'll find some strong support in that book for I bet. Your, your description. So Yeah, good. thank you. And that really helps too, um, because I, I'm really hot after this one particular fellowship to go stay for a week at University of West Georgia and go through Ingo's archives and do my own research there. So I better get myself pretty prepared if, if I want to try to try to do that. So thank you. Yeah. I might meet you there. I'm planning to go for a couple of weeks next year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we'll be hanging out. <laughs> I, I have access to a lot of the stuff already, but I, I, there's probably stuff that those people get, who gave me access might have missed. So I want to check myself. Yeah. 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 Okay, guys, uh, any of you guys want to ask Judy any questions or share anything? No hands up at the moment. I, I have a question. Yep, go for it. Um, Julia, my, um, in my former field of practice, I dealt with a lot of uh, convicted criminals who'd committed Oh, we say they were under lifetime supervision. They committed heinous acts. And um, I, multiple licenses in different field, in different aspects of the field is the best way to say it. But these people were, um, you know, I, I would, my supervising mentor was very, wary of me going into that room and uh, just, I I never I never felt um, afraid however I learned not to touch them yeah 
not not to put my hand out to shake hand. You know, that was completely, you know, that was off limits. I could tell that right away because they radiated. There was this energy around them. Yeah. That, that even though energy. they would be sitting with poker face, you know, just looking like affable neighbor next door who waved at everybody, whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, have, is that an experience that you, I mean, I, I've, I heard, I've processed everything you said about unconditional love and we've already had that conversation. However, um, yeah. to me, that experience was so, uh, of course I didn't talk to it about my mentor because he was very, you know, cut and dried. This is, this is the plan and this is what we do. However, um, I just made it a point of maintaining that physical dis- distance as required, plus maintaining that, uh, I don't want to call it a disconnect, but as you said, keeping my keeping myself un- un- disconnected from their consciousness. I mean, I knew what they had I didn't have to read the file to know what they had done, but this is not something my mentor and I ever discussed because I mean, they just radiated what they had done, even though, like I said, they were appearing as the affable guy next door, you know, Moses lawn every week or whatever. So have you had some kinds of experiences? Yes. (laughs) And um, I think it was great that you were unconditionally loving yourself by not touching them. And I think it was great that you were unconditionally uh, loving them by treating them exactly as they are, Um, being willing to go in there and see them as they are. And you were really seeing the truth of who they were, right? They were people who did these evil acts. That was the truth of who they were. And so, and that's, that's not judgment, that's just a fact and you were observing that. So I think that's kind of amazing. But yes, I've had that, those interactions with people. And unconditional love is the most protective thing in that situation. Unconditional love does not mean I'm going to give you a hug if you ask me for a hug. Or I'm going to shake your hand if you, I'm, I'm going to say yes to whatever you ask for. We have in our minds this idea that unconditional love means just saying yes to everything. But unconditional love is an energy. It's a force. It's not a behavior. So you can't tell from the outside, really, except you know people who are sensitive to energy, when someone has unconditional love, like someone could run into the street and grab their toddler and yell at their toddler, say, no, run into the house. And they could be unconditionally loving that toddler. They wanted to make sure the toddler didn't get run over by a car or they could be a total asshole. Exactly. Right? The um, the one one thing I did notice is that I had to become more sensitive to, to the supposed good people because I did have to assist in in returning one guy to prison. Mm-hmm. Good for you. Well, a lot of very influential people uh, in this town happened to uh, stand up for him and say he's a great guy. Yeah, and it wasn't. That's how I found out what, yeah. you know, they were protected. They, they, you know, he was a go through. It got very, it got very. Um... The thing that I think is key to remember is none of this is anyone's fault. Right. So people do horrible, horrible things. And some people need to be locked up for the sake of the rest of society. And some of them will tell you, I need to be locked up because I'm gonna do horrible things if I'm out there. Some of, them right. won't tell you, some of them won't tell you that, but it's still true. And so the thing to remember is it's not no one's fault. It's not their fault. Yeah, but then there's the supposed good people who, you know. It's no one's fault, though. that's no one's fault either. There's just, there's nothing to judge here. You know what I mean? There's yeah. nothing to judge because people are doing the best they can with what they got. And for someone, for some person, that means doing horrible things. That's the best they can with what they've got, even whether they're of high status or low status in culture, in society. So it's just it's the nature of the beast. This is how each of us are doing things in the world. 
and there's no one to blame, that doesn't mean there's nothing to do. There's a lot of good things that need to be done in the world to make it a better place like you did, calling out someone who needed to be um, seen in a different light, but it's no one's fault. That's the way I see it anyway. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I only had to have private security for about 18 months after that experience. Yeah. So that's what and, had to happen. Good for you. Yeah, I had to move on. Good. Kiara, you got another question you'd like to ask? That two unrelated questions. So I'll let Julia pick the better one because she knows what's better to talk about. The first one is really super simple. And I think you kind of covered it. And it's the idea about telepathy among family members, grandparents to grandkids, mother to baby partners. And then the next question, which again, totally unrelated, but maybe you might know something about it is the idea of uh, the stages of philosophical development in a person as they practice more CRV. Like Joseph McMonagall has talked about these five stages. I don't know what they are yet, but for example, he says, uh, I believe that the, the president has no power whatsoever than in social change or whatever. And he goes on about it. But is what he's trying to say is as you do more and more of this, opening yourself up to the unconditional I think you correctly call it love of all existence that, that, that exists as you do more and more of practice as a normal human, uh, your philosophy changes a bit. So uh, pick what, stab whichever one you like. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I got really involved in the Joe McMonagall thing and completely forgot your first question. What was the first question? Now I'm curious what the first question was. Well, the first question was just about uh, telepathy with family love. Ah. Yeah, yeah, let's go cover that one quickly. I don't know what the question is. It's sort of like, is there scientific evidence for that? Maybe that's the question. Or, mm. or just talk well, about it a little it bit. So much. I'm wondering if, if a person can use their unconditional love to get to that level or beyond. In other words, it's only a consequence of the reality that those people are already in love. Uh, and yeah. uh, that level of telepathy anyone can get by loving a rock if there is a real love between you and the oh, rock. Oh, cool. Yeah, I get your point. Um, yeah, maybe. That's really cool. Maybe so. Yeah, if you could get to a point where you could unconditionally love everything, perhaps your psychic abilities would be extremely accurate, but you also wouldn't care that much about them. <laughs> I mean, I kind of I kind of think um, that, that ties in both of those questions, right? <laughs> in a certain way. I do think that your philosophy changes the, the more you access unconditional love. And... Uh, and when I went when I went into the when I went into this knowing that things were going to change because unconditional love is the great ironically the great transformer right because unconditional love is already loving everything as it is and it doesn't need to change at all strangely very transformative um, but um, before I sort of started really intentionally accessing that I thought things are going to change I thought no I'm just going to hold on to this one idea so I can get really good you know just like some bullshit, you know, and, and within seconds that's gone. So um, it does change, but you don't really have a lot of control over that. But in my experience, it feels good. So I don't care that I don't have control over it. I feel like I'm in good hands. <laughs> ah. um, we have a comment from Helen in the chat. She says, if Julia could take another moment to delve into merging, without being too, too intrusive or being influenced in the senses from the target. Ah, so how do you protect yourself and merge? Well, first of all, if you can't figure out a way to do it, um, protecting yourself, then you don't do it, right? It's easier for me probably to do it than, than most women in the sense that I'm used to, I'm, again, there's something about being six feet tall. Like I, in any situation, if I'm, if I'm with a group of women who are generally shorter than me, if, even if they don't know me, they'll turn to me and ask me what to do because I'm like this tall little lightning rod, you know, and biologically you talk to the tall person. And so I've learned this. Um, so one thing I've learned to do is to radiate out a lot of energy, which seems like it takes a lot of work, but it's extremely protective. So it's like if you're absorbing energy and women are often trained to absorb other people's energy, like little sponges, um, it's much harder on us to merge because you're going to automatically go, oh, I want to help you or whatever. I'm going to absorb your energy. 
as if that's helpful, which it's not. But anyway, but if you can learn to, to radiate like a light, it protects you. It's like creating a force field out of the unconditional love that's coming through you. So that's my suggestion. So, so it's like for anyone, okay, here's another piece of it. If you have a trauma history, you're very likely to not, to some on some level to not want to be seen because you want to remain hidden so that you don't get hurt, right? If you can get over that, it will be very helpful. So being seen is extremely protective, right? Like just think of women as we know when it's late at night and it's dark, you walk on the side of the street that has the most light, right? Being seen is protective. So standing up and saying, here I am, instead of trying to sneak around, men, I, this is a gender thing, men on average have a more difficulty not being seen. Like, they, like unless they're spies, they're not trained how to sneak around and be kind of invisible. Women use invisibility like a, like a uh, tool to survive, but it's not helpful. <laughs> you gotta be seen. So, yeah. Uh, Don, you're up next for your question. Okay. Uh, I have something to share, actually. And uh, um, this is, this is a, a time travel story, and it happened to me. And I've spent so much time thinking about this that uh, I just like to put it out there for, you know, you and really everyone to, to think about. And uh, uh, this is going to sound really goofy, but you know, if you if you have ever had a cat, or if you, you own a cat, whatever, you'll relate to this story a little bit better. The story goes like this: <clears throat> I'm retired now, but when I was doing uh, nine to five every day, I came home one afternoon, and I was really uh, had a headache, and I you know it was one of those days where I didn't even want to eat dinner i just wanted to like fall into a bed and go to sleep uh, take a nap it was in the summertime so there was still sunlight streaming through the windows and i didn't even have the energy to go into our own bedroom our kids weren't living with us anymore and this is a detail that will be important is i just fell asleep in my son's room so in my headache, I started drifting off as I hoped I would. And I started getting back into a scenario that I remembered when I was maybe about 16. I was starting to see my father's shoe store where I used to work. And, and it intrigued me that, you know, I saw little bits of that room and, um, I started remembering the air conditioner that they had up on the wall over there. And then I thought to myself, oh yeah, isn't there something over to the right? There's a there's a, a, a charging counter where the customers come to pay for their products. And I started like focusing in on, on uh, everything. And then I remembered where I used to sit with the light coming in in the afternoon, sort of like around the same time that I was falling asleep, I guess, in my my room. And uh, as I was sitting there, I remembered this chair that I was sitting there uh, in uh, when we didn't have any customers. And there was also another one of the salesmen sitting next to me. When all of a sudden, our cat who didn't understand why I was in this other room. Why was I in my son's room? What was I doing in there? Put out a, a kind of a screech, like, -ah! almost like a question. And the salesman that was sitting next to me in the shoe store said, what was that? And I said, it sounded like a cat. And then I woke up. I realized I was in this bed. But somehow, it seemed like that sound 
went into the past and was actually heard by me and another person. And I remembered this thing because it was so unusual, that sound that the cat had made. And um, after I had that experience, I mean, is this making sense to you? Is, is the details connecting? Okay. So after I had that as experience, I started wondering if I could contact myself in the past deliberately to, to try playing the lottery or something like that. You know, let's go a couple of, start, remember, start tracking what the winning lottery numbers are and then I'll sit in the same place every day at the same time and I'll try to communicate. I have a small window. Maybe I can get a cat's meow's worth of audio across time to, 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 to my subconscious or even maybe I hear it. I don't know how it works. And um, I don't know. I just, I've been given that a lot of thought for a long time. I just thought I would put that story out there and, you know, if you have any comments. Yeah, I mean, uh, the reason why, the, the, the original reason why I started thinking about time travel, I believe, is when I would have um, this kind of, by the way, my father, the uh, physicist, wonderful person in many ways, but also messed up, mentally ill, and was abusive when I was a child. And when I would be lying in bed and he would do this ritual sort of abuse, I had this um, mind's eye image of an older woman with brown hair, kind of wavy, in this chair next to my bed. And she was really supportive. And she would say, you know, Julia, it's really okay to be mad at your dad. He loves you, but he's messed up. And he's going to regret this later. And you're going to be fine. And she would just continue to say things like that. It was very supportive. It was all in my mind's eye. Mm. When I realized that she was myself, my future self, was when I was in therapy, um, you know, decades later trying to work through this stuff. And my therapist asked me to go back in time and just sort of sit with my younger self. And that's what I remembered. Oh, right, there was that woman. She knew what she was talking about. I trusted her. I couldn't trust anyone in my family, but I trusted her. And then I realized, oh, I trusted me. Um, of course, I lived in this old farmhouse and there was really no one else around to trust, you know? And um, that saved my life in a certain sense. And so, yes, I think that's why that has pulled me from the future all along. Like, and now my scientific capacity, I'm not a physicist, but all of a sudden I think of this experiment with this optical system that turns out to potentially be revolutionary and all along I get these insights from my future self telling me to do this particular setting and not this setting and and like weird electrical things will happen that I don't have any control over but they reveal to me that I needed to use this other thing even though it doesn't make any sense that those things just happened and so I think it's happening a lot I don't think it's happening to just me I think it's happening to a lot of people and um I think the more we embrace our many selves over time and how they can communicate, the more we get to where human, the human capacity could actually be fulfilled in terms of learning how to be with each other and with ourselves in a way that's more peaceful and productive and get on with it in terms of um, uh, doing the work that we need to do as humans here. So I think it's a big part of our human story to start to recognize that that stuff is real and uh, we don't have to run away from it. It's extremely helpful. Hmm. So, yeah. All right, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Don. Uh, Kavan, you're up next. Yes, thank you, Daz. Hi, Julia. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so my question is, uh, Dean Radin, in most of his uh, experiments, and, uh, you know, talks, speaks of uh, his pre-sentiment experiments being one of the most reliable ways of uh, predicting the future using, you know, uh, psychophysiological aspects. Yeah. And uh, you also have, uh, you know, some research going on there, right? Yeah. So, uh, but then, you know, my question is, uh, you know, the, the time span for uh, 
accurately predicting uh, you know, the future in pre-sentiment experiments is from one to nine seconds uh, as observed. And, and, yeah. and, and, and I mean, it, it's a very short time span is, is what I... Yeah, that's why uh, I started studying remote viewing, exactly why. Okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, have you uh, actually thought of combining uh, aspects of, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, you know, there is remote viewing, there is mental time traveling and things as such, and you speak of uh, unconditional love. So is there a way of combining unconditional love with, you know, the physiological aspects? And is there a way to expand this time frame for, you know, uh, predictable uh, time traveling methods? Is I think it's a waste to try to expand. So I, here's, here's why I think the time frame is so short for physiology. It's yeah. such a false... Um, it's such a controlled experiment where there's a particular duration in between events. Uh, so for instance, in these experiments, for those who don't know about them, you basically have a person sit in front of a computer monitor and they know that they're going to see either an emotional image, like a picture of a plane crash or a neutral image, like a sunset. And that'll happen again and again and again. And you monitor their physiology as they do this. So those are randomized. Um, and what you do is you look at the physiology leading up to each of the classes of images. So neutral versus uh, negative or, or arousing or whatever you want to call them, um, or emotional, let's say. And what you see is that on average, there's this difference so that it's as if the body was preparing for an emotional event before the emotional event occurred. And there's a big body of research on this. And I did a meta-analysis on this with some other people uh, Patrizia Trasoldi at University of Italy and yeah. Jessica Utz at UC Irvine. And um, so I'm very convinced. We were very conservative in our meta-analysis, which means we worked against ourselves to not find an effect, but we found an effect. So I'm convinced that that stuff is real. And the reason that it's so fast, the time frame, is because in physiology, so many things are happening in real life you have an event and then you have another an event and another event. If they were long-term, you wouldn't know what to tie the change to. So it's, to me, it's no use pushing that out because what you're teaching people do is to not respond to other things that in real life might actually be important and would be intervening in between the stimuli you do want them to respond to. So I think the better method is to do precognitive remote viewing, which has a much longer time frame years, <laughs> weeks, months, days, decades. Okay. And um, combine that with unconditional love and, and mental time travel, which is the kind of, I was talking about with, with my father in that, in that bedroom. And mm. yeah, that's a natural, it seems to me. But you don't have to push anything out. Um, I agree with Dean that it's very reliable, but precognitive remote viewing has a bigger effect size and is frankly just as reliable as presentiment. So... Um, yeah, I kind of think, um, okay. that's the way to go. That's, that's really good to know. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, we have Helen, uh, next, she wants to ask you another question. Okay. Is it Hel Helen or Helene? Helene. It's Helene. Yeah. Oh, um, except we can't hear you, Helene. Okay, there we go. My question goes back to your merging and thank you for your explanation of the protection. It goes a little further. I know a lot of people who are mediums who merge with the person who died. I also know people who get into the skin of um, an abuser or a murderer. And um, some people say it's intrusive, it's violating their privacy. And I, my concern is how do you not pick up that person's energy? And you kind of alluded to it. And I wonder if you can take that a little bit further because your comment was, it's my picture of the person. Yeah, Thank so, yeah that's, that, um, that's a Lynn Buchanan way of thinking about things and I really like it. It really helped me. So I'm afraid of heights and when I would do a session, you know, precognitively, so totally blind, no one knew what the target was. Um, uh, where, where the target was up high, I would build a wall around myself. I'd say, the first thing I notice about this site is there's a wall on all four sides of me, you know? 
And then I would realize later, oh, right, that's because it must be a target that's up high. So I don't want to see the fact that I'm up high. So I'm going to build a wall. So, um, so one of the things he talks about is what you're seeing is your world version of, of, of the universe. And sometimes that could get in the way, like in the wall thing. So I have to learn over time if there's a wall, what that means is I'm up high and I can let go of the wall. And I can realize, wait, I'm totally safe. I'm not going to fall because I'm not actually in a situation. I can open my eyes and see I'm not actually physically in a situation where I'm at risk. And so then I can get more information. Well, it's the same thing with another human being. Like, and I worry about the intrusion and the, and the privacy issues too. So if instead I make a copy of the universe and I put it in my mind, and then I make the intention to get useful information about what's going on with this person, right? Um, I, I can then step into my projection of them as a human being and get the information that's appropriate without bothering them at all. And also I make the assumption that I don't know if this is a good assumption or not, but it works for me that they're not going to allow anything they don't want to be known to be put in my copy of the universe. Right? So if they want something to be known, I've worked with um, some law enforcement people and, and worked with some very um, unsavory characters. Interestingly, not a lot of them blocked me from knowing things <laughs> that were useful to know. I think they're almost like Ida was saying, almost um, the information was almost pouring out of them. Um, so I don't know if my assumption is correct or not, but it does feel very different from in the past before I did it, before I learned to make this sort of picture, I would actually like be in the person and look down and I would see their arms as my arms. And it was, too much and not a good idea. So this was this is a better way to do it for me. Thank you so much. That answers me. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, and I think you're up next, Russell. I, I, I really admire your personal candidness. It's so liberating <laughs> because somebody share so freely and competently. Um, also, I have to secretly admire your humility because a lot of the questions that are coming up in the bookworm in me cannot help it. Don, um, in their uh, book, Transcendent Mind, they have 30 pages called Rethinking Time. And it's one of the first times, no pun intended, that I myself ever really felt conceptual understanding of time. Now I might just say, okay, that's off limits. Um, also for the people asking about that, uh, the, the melding, you know, chapter two is, is probably nearly 30 pages or 20 some pages called Shared Mind, which discusses a lot of these principles. So I just, I love to refer, you know, books. So like Julia said, I'm not a plant, but your, your openness is, is just tremendous and, and healing and creates so many open doors for everybody else. That would be my last comment. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. And just so you know, I had to learn that being open is in fact the safest thing for me. Um, so it's again, back to that being seen. Um, if I could be completely open and there's nothing hidden, there's no reason for anyone to intrude and try to find secret information inside of me, right? Because it's all right there. And so it's extremely, um, strengthening the practice of radical honesty is is really strengthening so thank you kavan you you have another question yeah so uh this is just something which recently came up um you know Neuralink, uh, elon musk's company they yeah. came up with a video showing that you know there was a monkey with the chip in it and you know uh, they did all kinds of machine learning analysis and things like that. And it seems like, you know, uh, uh, the monkey somehow had a way of, I mean, uh, it was basically uh, an electronic kind of a communication. It was more of like an electro telekinesis kind of a thing, I guess. Uh, or electrical so I, 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 telepathy I, I, kind of thing. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. so so it's yeah so it, it seems like you know they have achieved some kind of electrical telepathy as you said uh, do you think we can extend this uh, towards time traveling eventually so what are your thoughts on this is it, oh is i mean i think we already do i mean i think that's kind of a description of what don was talking about what i was talking about so i think that none of these things are um new or really that revolutionary they're just under discussed so they're happening to a lot of people when i when i talk about the stuff with the time travel stuff a lot of people have these stories i mean like this is there are a dime a dozen like people are having these experiences <laughs> people are having experiences of actual influence over time in the wrong direction of time right that's just a stale oh, hi hi hello nice to see you um sorry there was a baby <laughs> everything goes away just happy when to see everyone <laughs> nice to see you pablo's baby hello what's her name her name is mariana hi mariana you're beautiful thank oh, you very like much the, looks like the, the, she's a usual in the friday meetings so she uh, also looks for them for all the week long i bet she looks like the sunset's coming out of her head. Um, so anyway, before I got baby head, what was I saying? <laughs> oh, telepathy and the Elon Musk's thing and time travel. Yeah, so I, um, I think Elon Musk's thing is sort of funny because it's going through all this incredible like billions of dollars to try to do something with physical brains that we can already do with our minds. And so it's hilarious. Like, I just think that's a that's what the materialist paradigm does to people. It makes them spend billions of dollars to try to imitate something we already know how to do and have known how to do for thousands of years, instead of actually trying to figure out how we can shift culture so that it's totally acceptable to say, hey, I'm going to send you a telepathic text around the time that I'm ready for our phone call. So just be on the alert. Okay, sounds good. Boom. Like, why? Why are we not doing yeah. that? Right? That seems like yeah. a reasonable thing to do. And it's free. So, um, that's, that's my sense of that. And in terms of time travel, same thing. None of this is like sexy to high technology stuff. It's thousands of years old um, technology that we ignore. So it's mm -hmm. a cultural shift, which is harder than a technological shift. Yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, just adding the technology aspect of it, you know, if you just look at uh, the past, right? Like, you know, there's been a lot of conspiracies behind the Montauk project. And, uh, you know, much before that, there was the Philadelphia experiments. Seems like the government and, you know, uh, people with a lot of money have been investing in time travel technology, like physical time travel technologies as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you think that would be something uh, useful? Uh, because, you know, uh, yes, we can, uh, you know, send telepathic information and things like that. But then if you look at, our mobile phones today, right? Like, you know, it's, it's a technological piece, which is, mm -hmm. uh, which is more re uh, reliable and, you know, more effective in, in, in many other ways as such. Uh, but do you think that is something uh, uh, we as a, a technologically advanced civilization is moving towards like time travel? Is, is that- uh, Well, I think we are, right? I mean, I think we already have, um, as you have pointed out, um, but I think that in terms of scaling that so it's beneficial to humanity that's the work that's ahead i will share with you this is a good segue to share with you my uh, website for my nonprofit, the institute for love and time so loveandtime.org so that's what this is about um we envision a world where unconditional love and travel and time are integrated into human and planetary thriving so the goal of this organization um is to actually consciously shape the progress of the bringing time travel to market um, and in a scalable way that actually helps humanity and the planet. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, the answer is yes, let's try to do it right. I was raised in the Cold War era where there was a lot of fear about the way the technology of atomic weapons um, was being brought to market and being used. And it just seems like we can shift that if we tie in time travel with unconditional love. 
we can shift that. We can make a new way of bringing technology to the fore that actually shifts the cultural piece that needs to change in order for that technology to be beneficial at a worldwide level. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Great. Thank yeah, you. thanks, thanks a lot. Kavad, nice to see you. Yeah. Okay, Rich. Rich is up next. Yeah, hi, Julia. Um, hey, hi. Hi, my apologies. I missed the first half of this because of work, but uh, so this may have been asked or even talked about, but I was just curious with your research and stuff. Um, so it just seems with all things esoteric and remote viewing too, and I may be wrong here, but that everything is intention-based and belief-based, which you truly believe has a placebo effect. Um, not to say it's fake, but it has a placebo effect, right? So do you do you find that in your research that things like remote viewing and everything, if you think that um, uh, the way you do something or anything like that will have an improvement on your viewing, it will, or is there actual uh, validity to the methodologies we have? I guess you could say like swimming, whether you believe a breaststroke will help you swim or not, if you do the technique right, you're gonna swim. Um, or is it hard to pin down things scientifically because of the intention and subjectivity of like consciousness? Okay, so let me back up. The way we would, so first of all, this question hasn't been asked, so no worries there. And, um, and I don't know if anyone could ever say if anyone was right or wrong about that question, so no worries there. Um, but the way that you ask the question scientifically about how belief impacts performance on a particular psychic task is you have to choose a psychic task that's constrained enough so that performance is so variable that you can actually see it in effect. And so this is something that most people don't use remote, most researchers don't use remote viewing for because that's a free response method. And there's as many ways to be a remote viewer as there are to be a human being. Whereas if you use a forced choice method, like choose this or this, you know, there's only two choices, this or this. And then, and then it's easier to correlate. And so I can tell you from the studies that um, have been done over the last couple of decades with forced choice methods for precognition and telepathy and clairvoyance, especially for precognition, your sign belief, and I say especially not because it's especially true, but it's been especially examined for precognition, your belief in psi absolutely influences your capacity. But it, depending on the task, what I'm finding with my own data from that site three app I mentioned, depending on the task, um, sometimes your performance could be better when you have higher side belief and sometimes it could be worse. Like you have such high side belief and you have such confidence in it that you have a certain level of performance anxiety that drives down your score. That's my ex explanation for it. I don't actually know what's going on inside people's heads, but that's what we see sometimes and sometimes it makes it better and it could depend on the task and how the task is presented and the subpopulation um so and 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 the age i mean that and the, and the gender and the i mean in other words there's a bunch of demographics that have this interplay that create these subpopulations that have different responses to that so now if you took that just from a forced choice task and you applied it to remote viewing now you multiply your noise in the experiment by a million because um, unless you're just looking at ARV or something where there's just a forced choice, there's a lot of ways uh, to look at those data. So I guess my answer is um, for sure, if we can extrapolate from these forced choice tasks onto remote viewing, which is just another psych kind of psychic functioning, psi belief would have to have an impact. What that impact is, may depend on all these demographics and, and under which pile of demographics you sit. And that depends on the task itself because they switch around. So it's a complicated system. And then the other piece of it, is there actually something there that if you just do the breaststroke, you'll get better at? I think there's almost, it's very hard to deny that there's just something there that if you just do the breaststroke, you'll do it. I mean, just because even all the way back to Stargate, you know, when Russ Targ would get um, military guys to show up who didn't believe in this stuff. And he'd be like, yeah, okay, I get you don't believe in it, but just close your eyes and 
imagine there's a door, you walk through the door, what's the most surprising thing you see? And they were able to nail the target. So there's ways to do it, regardless of your skepticism, that actually have an impact. And that's because, of course, it is a real skill. So. Brilliant, thank you. I don't know if it's brilliant, but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll make these two the last two questions because we've been going uh, two hours, 20 minutes, and Judy has been doing a lot of walking. Uh, <laughs> so Pablo, oh, yeah. About three, Pablo, if you want to go next. Three miles, really. Thank Not you, Das. So, so, Julia, when I heard that the talk about technology and everything, something popped up back in my mind, there were some experiments back, I think, in the 70s by the Meta Science Foundation, and they, they found a device based on older devices that in fact what you were thinking you could hear it out loud and in fact have two-way communication with other person at the other side no intrusive uh, nothing it was just the, the key element was a person uh, there to to make the device work right but uh, the talk is not about the device it's more like there were a lot of people interested and at the beginning many other people started going against it and used fear for that that they instilled fear in people so they would not pursue that anymore so what i was i would like to know what you think about is i was thinking in conditional love and many people i think see that as too big for them that they start fearing and they incite fear in others because i i don't really feel there's any kind of conspiracy i guess that it's something way much bigger than us it's just people being like outshined by something that they would like to be in but they they cannot comprehend or, or get near what do you think about that oh yeah i don't believe um i think we 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 like to invent cons conspiracies sometimes conspiracies are true i mean sometimes people do get together and conspire but I think generally most of the biggest world problems are because we haven't solved the basic human problem of how to be with ourselves and each other. And um, of course there's a force outside of us that is much bigger than us that is unconditional love. And of course, um, of course we get scared about losing our sense of self or being outshone as you say. And, um, but fear is what happens in the void where unconditional love is not. So it's very, very difficult to be afraid when you're, I don't even know if you can be afraid when you're experiencing unconditional love. Because what are you afraid of? That you might die? You know, that you might hurt someone else? I mean, like, it just, I just can't think of anything that you would be afraid of. There's nothing to fear. And so when people get into that, use that fear, it's a way of shutting the aperture, shut it down. Like they don't even have to discourage people from doing this practice just by creating the fear, it shuts it down. Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah. Um, for the last question then, it'd be Don for today. Okay, uh, this is going to be a quick one. Uh, Julia, I saw, uh, I guess this was like maybe a year ago that you and John Vivanco were doing a joint um, uh, class? class together. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering, um, uh, are you going to be doing some more work with him or was that just a one-time gig? Well, we did about four or five classes together at our six. I don't know. We did a bunch of them. We just did one YouTube video for one of them, but then he wanted to kind of go in his direction and I wanted to go in mine. So we haven't done that this year. I'm not doing any teaching except for with two people who approached me and wouldn't stop. And so I'm teaching them, but that's it. Yeah. Not I wonder it. because he's doing this television thing now too. And so it seems like, uh, you know, he's even hard to reach. So I was wondering if he was like still connected in a, yeah, Listen. you'd have to try him and see how it is for you. I think it depends on the person. Um, and he's definitely a busy guy, and he's definitely doing this television thing, which I think is kind of interesting. But um, no, I don't think we're planning on teaching again this year. I've, I'm, um, I put off a lot of my teaching until next year so that I could go through Lynn's course and learn more about uh, the military form of remote viewing to see what I'm missing there, if anything. All right, and, thank uh, you. And so, yeah. So, yeah, but also I think the reliance on teachers is, I don't know. I think teachers are great, but I also kind of think this is a human birthright. Like, 
You can just, you know, do it. <laughs> yeah, really. I feel bad taking money from people because it's like, I'm telling you, like, this is how you breathe in and out, you know? <laughs> okay, thank you. Julia, I just want to say on behalf of everyone here today, uh, thanks for all answering all these questions and taking the time with us and doing all the walking at the same time. Yeah, I got my three miles in. Very slow pace. Like I don't know if you've ever seen a zombie movie, but it's sort of like a zombie <laughs> sort of pace. Oh, da, 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 da. <laughs> thanks it's been for a great me. evening full of, uh, full of great information, and thank you for that. Thank you. Everyone, thanks so much. It was really great to talk thank with you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. I love thank you, you too. I loved it too. Thanks. And see yeah, you later. We'll to, to we'll definitely do it again. Thank you, everyone. You have a good weekend, and I'll, I'll get this video on YouTube uh, probably tomorrow sometime. Thank you so Take much. Care, Take care, everyone. Take care, everyone. Talk soon. Bye. Thanks, Julia. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye.